I'd like to introduce the first um, speakers, um, both from Goldsmiths University London, um, Dr. Kat Jung Nickel and Dr. Katja May. Um, uh, Dr. John Nickel, Nickel is Principal Investigator of, the, of an ERC funded politics of patents project and um, Katya May is the, a fellow on the same project. Um, I'm going to leave it to you two to introduce your research um, so because um, I know that we're short of time so I will be keeping an eye on the time and I'll put stuff in the, in the um, chat uh, when, when you've got two minutes left, I'll, I'll put that in the chat if that's useful for you. Okay, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much, um, Catherine. And I'll just share my screen. How does that look? Is that looking fine? Yes, that looks good. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to the organisers for hosting this event. And just apologies in advance. Um, I've got builders upstairs and roadworks out the front. Um, so London lockdown is a gift that just keeps giving. So apologies for any noise that's going to happen. We might be lucky. Okay, so um, yes, I'm Kat Jungnickel and together with Katya May, we're giving this talk from the plague um, proboscis to pandemic PPE, unmasking the inventive socio histories of face coverings. So I'm the um, PI and Katya is the postdoc on the politics of patents research project, otherwise known as POP. Um, and we're midway through the research, so we really appreciate this opportunity to speak to one of the emerging themes in the project. And like many, we didn't originally think that masks were going to be so significant in our research or in our daily life. Um, and it turns out they're very present in both. And there's lots of data in all of that. So I'll start with a little bit about the context of which we're exploring the inventive socio histories of face coverings. So POP is a global sociological study of 200 years of clothing inventions from 1820 to 2020. It's funded by a European Research Council grant and we're exploring the connections between citizenship and clothing. We're interested in understanding how inventors create new forms of clothing that reinforce or resist, subvert or disrupt social and political norms and beliefs and in the process bring new expressions of citizenship into being. So these are our main uh, intersecting themes. Uh, citizenship has always been a critically important topic and is even more so today. There's lots of discussion and debate about citizenship, who is and isn't a citizen, who has the rights to it, who doesn't and what it all means. But critical citizenship scholars have argued that it's not just about legal status, borders, the nation state, who has a passport, who can vote and who can't. It's much more than these narrow top-down categories. They say it's something that's practiced and negotiated, claimed and struggled for on a daily basis. And POP takes an unusual approach to this topic by clothing. Clothing we see as a barometer of socio-political change. And it's easy for some to trivialize or overlook the value of clothing in this context. And I'm sure I don't have, but it is a critical socio-technology that touches every single body. From swimsuits to spacesuits, clothing directly connects social life to the political world and as such is central to changing ideas around the politics of gender and identity, mobility, power relations, access to resources, inclusion and exclusion and so much more. Yet despite this, clothing is largely underexplored in relation to citizenship studies and historically this area of scholarship has not been a primary focus for clothing scholars. So why study inventions? Well, inventions are considered central by many to ideas around modernity and progress, and patenting is a key way of studying them. Although not all great ideas have been patented, of course, and that's a whole other talk, but the patent archives still provide a means through which we can systematically map and examine transnational invention over time. Patents are a way of studying what in science and technology studies, and that's mostly where I'm located, what we call world making practices. So inventors are really interesting because they operate on the cutting edge of social and political change. They build on the past to make claims on the present and imagine different futures. Patents also provide really fascinating data because in the process of outlining problems and proposing solutions, clothing inventors reveal how different discourses of risk and identity and belonging have been debated, imagined and materialized on bodies over time. 
So we can map inventions on different bodies and against each other across time and space and socio-political happenings. And we can also ask what's not in the patent archive and attempt to render visible systematic erasures, gaps and silences. And yet, despite all this, and you can tell I'm a bit of a fan of patents, patents are rarely the subject of sustained social science inquiry. So what we're trying to do is contribute to these three bodies of literature. First, we're exploring clothing inventions in relation to citizenship studies, and particularly the work of Isen and Nielsen and Scheller, who talk about acts and enactments. And these are practices of making, claiming and performing new forms of citizenship. We're also, of course, interested in critical clothing studies and particularly the work of people like Parkins and Entwistle, who explore clothing as sites of political struggle, whereby people use clothes to fashion a body politic to contest or legitimise social norms. And also in terms of what science and technology studies people call translations. So at POP, we don't take clothing for granted, but rather consider it to be a socio-technical device that enables, constrains, and organizes bodies in different ways. And we do this by approaching clothing as three-dimensional arguments, and a bit about that in a minute. So just basically, central to our research is the idea that citizenship practices can be explored through patented clothing inventions. And what's at stake for us is an opportunity to better understand alternate embodied ways in which people produce, practice and express political subjectivities on a daily basis. And there's some of the core questions that the project is attempting to do. And just very briefly, how are we doing this? Um, POP takes an inventive approach to the study of inventions. It builds on the work that I've done on projects such as Bikes and Bloomers, where my, my team and I reconstructed a collection of 1890s convertible cycling costumes patented by ingenious Victorian women. With POP, our scope is so much bigger and involves five interrelated work packages. So far, we've done WP1, or Work Package 1, which is a, um, mapping across time, and that's a big quantitative um, clustering analysis to identify key themes in the data. We're in work package two at the moment, mapping across theme, um, and we're doing qualitative deep dives into these emerging themes. We've also started on work package four, um, where we're interviewing inventors, designers, hackers, and makers to understand how they conceive of citizenship by our inventive forms of clothing. Um, and next we'll be moving on to work package three, where we map across the bodies. The aim here is to get inside, underneath, and beyond the surface of the text and into clothing inventions such as face coverings to better understand them. We aim to place bodies and embodiments and different and diverse bodies back into this historic research. So the project is premised on the idea that such some data such as clothing cannot be fully translated into text and images. They must be known through touch, through movement on the body, in multi-dimensional experience and engagement. And of course, clothing is designed to work with and on bodies, therefore it reveals different kinds of data and generates different kinds of knowing when experienced close to the skin. So in that way, we aim to explore clothing inventions as three and four dimensional arguments and construct and wear and try out and perform in a whole range of them in the next phase. We haven't made any face coverings or else, you know, historic ones or else we're wearing them right now, but we'll be doing this very soon. So back to the specific focus of this talk, so face coverings and citizenship, how do they relate? Well, firstly, what do we already know? Well, the idea of open, transparent faces and bodies as markers of trust has a long history in Enlightenment political traditions, particularly in the global north. And these ideas really underpin many contemporary surveillance technologies and increasingly um, all the biometric tech that surrounds us. There's really a lot of great work around this that conflates transparency, citizenship and trustworthiness in the fields of privacy, surveillance and security studies. There's also a long history of the pathologizing of Muslim veiling practices in discourses around immigration and assimilation historically and more recently we've seen that in context of the war on terror. And of course, with the pandemic, we see daily debates between scientific sage advice, government messaging and fears um, about citizens' rights being restricted. So what else can the patent archive and the history of clothing inventions tell us? Well, what we're hoping to bring is a historical perspective to this topic. There, these are some of the questions that we're asking. We're interested in the politics of face coverings, how they've changed and remained unchanged over time, who gets their face covered and who doesn't and why, 
Do these disparities map onto other forms of invisibility, inequality and injustice? And what other kinds of covered faces are in the archive? And what can they tell us about the changing nature of citizenship rights and responsibilities? So from the 17th century plague mask to today's pandemic PPE, there are a plethora of ways people have protected themselves and others from ever changing threats and risks. And patent archives provide surprisingly rich record of inventive individuals taking PPE into their own hands. So protection, as you can probably imagine, is a dominant discourse in the archives. Protecting um, people has been a central concern for many inventors for centuries. Yet despite this long and very global history, not everyone is or has ever been, of course, equally protected. And it's also a super interesting thing to study historically at a time when we're also participating in it. The top right pick there, for example, is one of me in double masks doing international travel back in July. Ah, international travel, it'd be nice to return to some of that at some point. So we start here by exploring what protection means in the archive, then open it up to a broader range of face masks and coverings. So the vast majority of masks and face covering inventions in the archive are unsurprisingly for the purpose of work. While that isn't surprising, what's interesting is the diverse range of working and also class types of faces that get protected. You can see here a selection of them, but there are loads. We have drivers and miners, laborers, pilots, aquanauts and astronauts, um, blacksmiths, carpenters, soldiers, welders, engineers, dentists, surgeons, and more. And the risks that they're addressing span from injury and disease, poison, contamination. And the focus here is on safety as a preventative strategy for protection. And critically, what these inventions equip wearers to do is to perform specific labor and also to claim expertise. So they're not only capable of doing specific jobs, but they're looking the part, which helps them claim all the space entitlements and privileges associated with them. And as per the nature of legal systems and gendered rights at different times and places, more men than women have patented ideas and they've generally invented things for, for people like themselves. So what is also evident visually is how, is how these inventors have predominantly imagined protecting a specific type of male body. And more on that within this category of life-saving citizens. Uh, this is another category in the archive that reflects on the surface very similar dominant discourses of safety and protection. It will come as no surprise again to see that lean, clean, um, shaven, short-haired white men, though there are a number of moustaches um, throughout the last century, are the dominant uh, subjects in this category as well. Particular types of bodies are imagined very clearly in representations here. And these imagined bodies really matter because there's a fo focus, particularly in these two categories, on fit for efficacy. And we've heard this in previous talks already today. So for example, the gas masks in the top right hand corner, uh, there's lots of gas masks invented for warfare and industrialized purposes. And a critical aim is to ensure the gas fit and tightness to the face for efficacy. And we're seeing the continued impact today of this focus on specific faces and bodies, the lack of fitting PPE for a wider diverse healthcare and rescue workforce. So now I'm gonna hand over to Katya now to talk about what else is in the archive. Right. So what other kinds of covered faces are in the archive besides this type of professional and highly competent, but also rather flat man that Kat just described? And what might these other types tell us about common understandings of protection and citizenship? Specifically, we're curious about how inventive face coverings can provide alternate ways of claiming space, expertise, rights and responsibilities. And our research in the patent archive is inspired by the work of Sarah Ahmed and Mimi Scheller, who are both interested in the political potential of alternatives and deviations from the norm and the pathways that are created as a result of such detours or deviations. We are interested in evidence of alternative directions in the closing patent archive. So how inventors have marked out different routes and journeys and consequently imagined alternate futures from the norm that render visible different users, uses, problems and solutions and thus, in Scheller's words, help us to unearth a different kind of political history. 
So let's look at some of the examples we've already unearthed. For centuries, inventors across the world have been concerned with equipping people for all types of outdoor conditions, such as wind, rain, the cold, the sun, and also general air pollution. Interestingly, inventions in this category are geared towards men and women in cross-class boundaries, as everyone seems to need protection from the weather at some point or other, including children, like in the top right corner, or women out walking in the rain. And this points to a broader recognition of reasons to be outside beyond the con conventional ideas of work, which is further amplified when we look at how face coverings are used to protect different types of mobile bodies. And there are masks for people who ride horses, cycle, or drive cars. And can you get to the next slide? Fine. Sorry. <laughs> And um, particularly striking is a wide range of veils for women automobilists that have been patented especially across the UK, US and Canada, and you can see them on this slide. And often these have been patented by women for women in the first two decades of the 20th century. And these veils protected women's faces from the dirt and the dust of the road. But just as importantly, they were to prevent women's face and hair from looking messy and unfeminine when women get out of the car after a drive. So with these automobilist rails, not only did women claim a presence as inventors in the archive, but they also made mobile women visible in the archive and on the roads. And another set of face coverings in this category recognizes mobile citizens or travelers need for privacy, and this includes, for example, special masks for sleeping on a plane or train, like the one you can see um, on, the bottom to, on the bottom to the left. And these are quite striking in relation to Islamic veiling practices, which are often at the center of neo-Orientalist -Orient immigration and assimilation debates in the global north. Here, covering the face gets linked to secrecy and in the context of the war on terror, is often framed as a threat to the nation. When on the other hand, a white male plane passenger might legitimately cover his face in the interest of personal comfort. So as I'm sure you're all aware, it matters what bodies are covering their faces. And to painted hijabs or other types of Muslim garments in a Western-centric patent and system can then be a way of making visible bodies that are mostly absent in the patent archive due to its colonial legacy. And more so, as contemporary hijab patents are especially concerned with enabling women to more comfortably do things like sports, they become also a way for hijabis in the global north to more prominently manifest their presence in all areas of life, from the streets and professional sports competitions to the healthcare sector, as special masks for hijabis are being invented. And there are also a number of face covers in the archive that are specifically intended to disguise or mask one's face, for example, for a ball, carnival, or Halloween. And though really, more or less any type of face cover can be used, or rather misused, to disguise the face. And this is obviously represented in all the idea of the criminal wearing the ski mask. But we'd like to suggest that we could also conceive of the covering of the face as an everyday act of resistance, as ordinary citizens can use it to avoid the omnipresence of surveillance technologies or to protect themselves from identification by state authorities during political acts of resistance, like members of um, the Pussy Riots during their unauthorized performance in a Russian Orthodox church. But as Teresa discussed earlier in the keynote, this obviously also works on the other side of the political spectrum. So these kinds of uses for marks are of course not explicitly discussed in the patents, or at least we've not come across any patent that actually says use this for resistant acts. But most face coverings inherently hold this potential for liberating anonymity and citizenly resistance, and thus not only serve to imagine a different future, but also actively recraft the present. And we can then also think about how masks for sexual activity can likewise be seen as liberating. And here, 
Heteronormative sexuality is about reproduction and ultimately about nation building. Masks for protection from STDs during all sex, like the ones on this slide or the kissing shield to the top left, however, carve out a space in the patent archive for the recognition of alternate, multiple and importantly non-reproductive sexual identities that are instead focused around personal pleasure and not in the interest of national reproduction. So why does all of this matter? Well, who gets to invent and what is invented and who gets invented for matters? Inventions and inventors enable, constrain and organize bodies. And a lot of masks are related to protection and for, and for PPE to work, it has to fit. And generally, these ideas of fit prioritize male bodies and key workers are suffering the consequences of this today. However, the archive also renders alternate bodies and issues visible and relevant, and it reveals a diverse range of masks and face coverings, thereby expanding the possibilities of practice, meaning and identity, and opening up ways to exploring alternate desire lines, in Ahmed's words, via multiple potentialities, diversities and difference, that rethink our ideas of citizenship. And really what we've just shown you is just the very beginning of our journey into the archive. So thank you very much for letting us share this with you and we look forward to your comments and questions. Kathy, you just need to unmute. No, you're still muted. I'm putting my mute on. There and you off. go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Thank you so much for um, for that. Such such an interesting presentation around patents. I've got questions to ask, <laughs> um, but we'll take questions at the end. So, the next speaker is Professor Fiona Hackney and Katie Jane Hill. Um, Fiona is, uh, works with us at MMU and is a design historian working on fashion culture, women's magazine, crafting, co-creation and social design. Um, and Katie is a lecturer in design at Wolverhampton School of Art and a PhD candidate at Northumbria University and worked on several AHRC projects. Um, they are going to present for us, enacting a sensibility for sustainable clothing, the quiet activism of making face masks. Um, okay, over to you, Fiona. I, I think uh, Katie's gonna, yeah, get the... Um, yeah, so that's not full screen though, is it? Should just yeah, that's it. That working okay now. Yep. Right. Move on to the next one. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much. I thought I'd done my stuff and then <laughs> I could speak again. Sorry, everyone. Be boring you to death. Um, yeah, so the quiet activism uh, was this is um, this project draws on work in particular that we've done with a, um, a, a HRC funded project called S for S. Um, which is a, about sustainability and clothing and um, how we can bring about behaviour change. Um, our starting point for it really was this idea that we know a lot about these horrendous facts and we heard you about the problems uh, within the fashion industry and um, how clothing is uh, and our clothing habits are destroying the planet. Uh, and in fact, we heard more of those this morning. Um, we know them, but how do we actually bring about real change in our in our behaviour in our lives? How, how you know how do we become responsible citizens and, in fact, demonstrate citizenly resistance, as the uh, paper before nicely put it, um, in terms of our thinking around sustainability and uh, and then and around face and what role I suppose what what part does face mask play in this and where are the relationships between the two because all of these things, as our panel before was saying, are all connected. 
Um, so our idea, our starting point for us, for us was the idea that if we draw on the energy and the creativity and uh, within stitch groups and stitch group activities and crafting activities and that kind of thing that had such a uh, growth in the past, you know, at least 10 years, um, you know, that, that maybe that's a space where these, uh, where this change can come about. So it's actually the making the engagement with the process of making and inserting groups, inserting themselves into the thinking around the fashion industry and the fashion cycle. Um, maybe behaviour change could come around, around that. Um, we worked with uh, policy academics at uh, University of Exeter and arts and fashion uh, practitioners and academics at the University of Wolverhampton so the project was located there. So the first slide just shows some of the sort of underpinning ideas behind this, quiet activism, um, co-production, um, communities and a commons of care. Um, so quiet activism was an idea I sort of developed with, with, with others, others working in the kind of crafting and craftivism uh, area some time ago and wrote an article about it in design and culture so do have a look at that. <laughs> I was trying to encourage reading of uh, one's work. Um, essentially, it's the idea of a quiet activism that's an embedded activism that's embedded in everyday life and uh, and around ideas of performance and performativity, really, that that we can bring about wider change by by um, by quietly changing uh, everyday um, practices and um, kind of values, expectations, it's all that kind of thing. These little changes can ripple out and, and have, make big changes. And I was particularly interested in um, women's uh, domestic making and crafting uh, and, uh, and how, and the values there and the ways that, that um, people could relate to each other, community, potentially communities around that, that could then be taken into the public world. What happens when um, those kind of um, uh, ideas and cultures and taken into the public world and that's uh, and the potential for thinking about a more caring community for a more um, caring society for a society um, whose uh, structures and um, uh, practices of governments except governance etc are organized around not making money but actually caring caring for each other caring for ourselves and caring for the planet and um, those ideas, of course, are becoming, uh, with pandemic, uh, are rising to the surface. Um, there's a lot of discussion around um, care. And um, just one example is um, uh, Amy Twigger Holroyd's um, pro project, Common um, uh, com Crafting, Crafting of Care, Crafting Commons of Care. So I can't remember the title. It's on there, actually. It's on, on the uh, slide there. Uh, crafting the Commons. Um, do have a look at that. Some really interesting discussion and blog posts uh, and things there. And then um, also the Care Collective published this year, the Care Manifesto, um, one of the uh, a whole series of verso books that are about responding to pandemic and, and, and the, uh, the rethink debate around this, which the BBC is also very active in. So, um, so communities at the heart of everything we do. Um, connected, the Connected Community Programme and there's um, a link there to uh, uh, their um, sort of summary um, book uh, summarising all the projects that ran over the past five, six years um, really was fundamental I think in, sh in shaping a, a lot of our thinking and a lot of other people's thinking. This is a big programme, you know, there was hundreds of projects involved in it. Um, a lot of thinking uh, within the academic community about how how we can work with real life projects and how we can partner with community groups and organizations to actually bring a, to do you know real real work um, real life work in in terms of our research and to do it um, with others to co produce it with others so co production was a central methodology that was explored in the connected communities program and i'm sure i don't know need to go through it in too much detail i'm sure a lot of you use co production as methodologies in your work already but essentially at the heart of it is about partnership and cl collaboration interdisciplinarity people working together to bring their skills and knowledge to answering to responding to answering and, and researching actually bringing about real change in terms of real life problems. Um, Practice-based research is also essential to this and ideas such as probes, you know, using diaries, workshops, um, etc. storytelling, performance mapping, all of that kind of thing. Okay, next slide please. 
Right, so this is the S for S project. Um, it's listed as some of our kind of underpinning ideas. This idea of think, feel, act became a sort of central motto motif for us about this process of rethinking things, but actually emotionally feeling, engaging, materially engaging with materials and, and uh, clothing. Um, and then the kind of action, the behavior action uh, that um, some, you know, ch sometimes change, sometimes not, sometimes more than the other, and trying to get a sense of how we can um, evaluate that, uh, that comes from that. So we use qualitative and quantitative methods. Um, central, in terms of our probes and research methods, um, making workshops and groups were key to that. We had about 40 participants altogether involved in, in workshops uh, that there was, I think it was about 40, work, 40 workshops, yeah, is that right? Um, that took place in, um, in the Midlands, in Wolverhampton, and also in Cornwall. And we had exchanges be between the groups. Um, we, the uh, participants kept clothing diaries. We were made ongoing reflective videos, um, uh, used questionnaires and wardrobe audits. And all that material is on our, our website. So um, do have a, a look at that. Next slide, please. Right, so uh, out of those different um, tool methods, research methods or tools for change as we started to think about them, was the wardrobe audit. Again, it's something that wasn't you know, unique to our project. There's uh, lots of people use wardrobe audits and use them in different ways, in fact. Um, so for us, the wardrobe audit, I think we had about um, 10 people across the two groups that did conducted uh, wardrobe audits with us. And it involved us asking people to do a clothing count um, of what of all the clothes they have, and then um, asking them to uh, um, no sorry asking them to do an estimate of what they imagine they have, and then do a clothing count. And of course, the results were pretty um, uh, shocking to people um, in there. And that that I think just about everybody had many more clothes than they thought they had. So one thing that came out of the project in terms was this: um, people said this project came at the right time for me. And in fact, the people who stuck with the project right the way through and in fact, who really kind of evidenced a significant behavior change in their work um, said this in many different ways to us. And so it sort of became, um, we started to realize that the project wasn't just about the community engagement and, and being part of the community to enact change, although that was really important. But it was also about the kind of the personal life journeys that were people were making and where they were at the point where they took part in the project. Um, the project came for the, at the right time for them, uh, often in terms of ruptures in their lives in some way, some kind of change, um, uh, uh, change of job or being made unemployed or their children leaving home, things like that. But this sort of moment where they really wanted to rethink themselves, their identities um, and what they were doing in the world. And, and this engagement with the project really became central to to then find to solving some of those problems, I suppose. So I've just put a list of, um, there's, there's two of our participants, Abigail and Sarah, both of whom did make major changes in terms of their uh, behavior around clothing, ethical clothing and pro-environmental clothing. Um, they have, and there's just a summary there of their kind of journeys and their different uh, positions where they're coming from uh, and it, that came out of the wardrobe audits. We did wardrobe discussions with them about clothing that lasted for several hours and um, both the, the stories around clothing um, were very important um, for both. Um, uh, and particularly for Abigail, this relationship with her family and her friends and these networks that she developed for passing on. Um, she took the pledge for years that she wouldn't talk about, uh, she wouldn't buy uh, any new, new clothing. Um, and uh, so, that, so for her, and also uh, charity shopping uh, was also really, really important for her. So, and mother-daughter relationships. And, the, and out of the project, she came up with a, uh, an idea to, to develop um, a program of workshops going into schools, um, uh, working with young people in terms of um, repurposing garments and uh, creative repair and all of that kind of thing, um, bound up with, the, with their involvement in, um, in you know, wanting to campaign and get involved in environmental change. Um, and uh, Sarah, similarly, um, she, uh, she was the girl guide leader and she developed programs to work with her, her um, she developed this program within the project to limit her buying by using, um, drawing on um, World War II, um, you know, the idea of buying coupons. So you limit your clothing 
purchases through coupons and she developed that uh, her own version of that and then also um, worked with that with her her um, the girl guides pack that she worked with okay so next slide I think that's me done oh yeah here's just some pictures uh, of them and the, and the wardrobe audits they were great fun and I recommend everyone does one next slide please And I'm handing over to Katie to talk to her experience of um, mask making. Yes, hello. So hopefully if I start talking, my face magically appears next to the slides. Um, yeah, so I was a research assistant at the University of Wolverhampton working with Fiona on the project. Um, but very much as we all were kind of participant researchers in the ESFRES project. So um, taking part in things like the wardrobe audits, um, and making in the workshops and so on and really kind of um yes trying to um reflect on our own um habits and so on but i think um this um what i wanted to sort of reflect on today was how um to sort of revisit some of those findings from the project and think about those in relation to the s4s project and um particularly how i feel like and some of my own experiences of making face masks during 2020 and um, for myself and my family and um, kind of resonated with some of those ideas so um one of the ideas that was actually rather than a finding sort of foundation of the project was this idea of social practices which is the, uh, the which was the bringing together of things competences and meaning and the idea that if you can if you can bring these things together that's that's an approach to take to um behavior change so that was the sort of idea i think underpinning the idea of using the making workshops and using community communities of people making together as as an approach to explore um behavior change and um there's a um a quote here from the results that as um articulated in the paper that was written for the political studies association um in um it must be i was thinking it was a year ago but time has uh, time has gone very strange and so i think it must be coming up to two years ago now um but that generally um our participants reported a much broader and deeper engagement in pro-environmental behaviors and there were other words that came out in findings like a sort of holistic understanding and increasing the kind of complexity and understanding of issues of sustainability and things like you know that sustainability is hard and the more you the more you try to address the problems the more sort of problems you uncover um, and this um, kind of resonated with me a bit in the experience of trying to work out sort of some of the certainly early on approaching making face coverings so there's a headline there on the page which is um, from May 2020 when opinions were still very much divided um, as I think one of the one of the earlier talks pointed out we were being advised not to wear face masks but there was a lot of kind of debate about that um, so just you know just the whole um, idea of whether it was a good idea to be um, making face masks for myself and my family at all was was in question and then the other image on this slide is um, is a chart which um, which shows the effectiveness of different types of materials and this was something that I remember seeing being shared on social media and actually particularly through the um, S4S um, sort of network of participants there's several of us who are still in contact on social media and, and sort of debates about you know what materials were best to use and so on um, and it was a very I remember when I started making the face mask it was a very kind of emotional you know a very sort of emotional making experience much more so really than I think everything I've been making um, since I was a young child, making and sewing all sorts of things. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's one of the most sort of kind of loaded uh, experiences of making things that I've ever had, because it felt like there was a real weight of responsibility and also a kind of, you know, political, sort of taking a political position in, in just the act of making and wearing um, um, face masks. Um, but also the fact that in lockdown, um, it sort of necessitated this change in habits and to be really thinking about um, habits um, which sort of linked again linked back to some of the findings around uh, meaning making and habits to click my own slide on there 
so that was the sort of thinking and feeling reflecting on the kind of thinking and feeling part of um, making face masks um, and then moving on to thinking about the actual actions and how I feel that kind of embodied um, embodied some of the kind of ideas from the S4S project so one of the things that was that my electric sewing machine was actually locked locked away in my artist's studio which had been closed so the sewing machine that I had access to was a hand-powered 1928 Singer cast iron uh, machine so I had to make do with the capabilities of that machine but it's actually I think probably the most reliable piece of equipment that I own even I, I own lots of things that have been made since um, again there was lots of you know there was lots of debate and decisions to be made about what you know how to make these masks things like um, the fit the fit was important whether a seam in the middle of the face mask would um, affect the efficiency of it and in the end I decided to use a um, face mask by an indie pattern maker called Gerata Davies um, who had um, designed a um, I guess a, a relatively complex um, face mask to make you probably would need to have some confidence in using a dressmaking pattern and so on but actually once I'd, once I'd sort of made a few I'd adapted to it um, and it's also I think the thing that I really want to um, to sort of bring out was the, the the awareness that this developed around the access to materials so there's a social social media Instagram post there of me and my um, partner experimenting in making face masks out of, out of a sock, which was one of the videos that was circulating. You could make one, which was quite a fun thing to try, but I didn't feel like it was going to be particularly effective. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's quite fun to do. Um, but it, eventually I ended up using um, repurposing men's shirts because that seemed to be the sort of highest quality um, material that I could get my hands on. And um, also just thinking about the whole process of making so I committed to doing zero waste making so I didn't I didn't discard any offcuts and I made use of all of the materials and at the same time was thinking about um, other kind of clothing related habits such as laundry and changing habits so I'm going to move on because I'm just conscious of time so just to wrap up and probably if anyone wants to come in as well I think the you know reflecting on sort of some of the discussions that Fiona and I've had in the last um, sort of weeks preparing for this and in thinking about um, the experiences of um, making face coverings in um, 2020 has sort of um, enabled us to kind of look again I think at the um, at the S4S project and really to sort of bring out some of these themes and I think like Fiona said this idea of care you know, care for ourselves and our families through the, ma the making of face masks, but also care for the wider community is something that's really coming to the forefront. Um, and that idea of the right, you know, the right ideas at the right time. Um, and the sort of consciousness of our responsibility towards um, each other, towards the planet and so on. I think that's... Oh, yeah, there. sorry. Yes. Yeah. And the, yeah, the value of creativity and um, the importance of community. And this goes back to what sort of David was saying, I think, in the first session as well. And it's about how so we were thinking about how you bring about this sort of behavior change in terms of pro environmental clothing and sustainability in the fashion industry. But uh, and our, our behavior as consumers or creative makers rather than consumers, probably, I suppose, sort of inserting ourselves. But also um, I've got to say about this idea of, so we're thinking of kind of our different research tools like the wardrobe audits and the workshops and the films and, and all of that kind of thing. These were sort of creating in between spaces that short circuited the flow of fashion. So they became these in between reflective spaces and in a way the discourse around masks and the wearing of masks is part of that is one of those um, in between space or could be one of those in between spaces where we start to to rethink our engagement with, um, you know, through textiles uh, uh, with the world. I think that's us finished, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was really interested in in your explorations with face masks. I think pr probably quite a few of us did it. Um, so I've got some questions again for you later. Really yeah. fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, moving on. Uh, our next speaker is Daniela Dossi. I hope I pronounced that right, Daniela. 
um, who is an Italian designer and researcher currently based in the Netherlands. Um, she trained as a designer at the Polytechnic University of Milan and the University of Brighton in the UK. Her research-led and process-driven design practice focuses on critically exploring socio-political issues and a cultural context, sorry, cultural contexts through micro-histories, ethnographic inquiries and semiotics. And um, Daniela is going to present today, Hybrid Heads, a decoding method to design open narratives and dynamic identities. Over to you, um, Daniela. Yes, uh, hello, hi. <laughs> I uh, will start sharing my screen now. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, can you see my screen? And yes, yeah, you can see it, yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the uh, invitation. Uh, um, I'm really pleased uh, to meet you all and to share my project uh, today. Um, and I'm uh, Daniela Dossi, an independent uh, Italian designer and researcher and I'm currently based in the Netherlands. Um, my presentation today will address the research process and design methodology of hybrid ads. An ongoing multidisciplinary and multi-layer project I initiated in 2015, originally in the context of an art residency at the Belgian textile collective Manoub. There were diverse iterations of the project between 2016 and 2019, finally resulting in the publication of the Hybrid Arts book uh, with NIE 010 publisher and uh, the creation of new artworks for a solo exhibition at Design Museum Ghent in Belgium. The exhibition ran from April 2019 to January 2020. Hybrid Ads is a decoding method to design open narratives and dynamic identities. Addresses and coverings are among the most powerful vehicles of cultural identity, whether of nationality, gender, ethnicity, religion, profession, or subculture. With Hybrid Ads, my aim is to question the semiotic, political, cultural and social values of contemporary address. And exploring an extensive archive of press photos from around the world. Starting from these, I develop a decoding method and open design system to create dynamic cultural identities. Cultural identities all over constantly. Within the framework of this project, there is an interplay of images, text, and textiles. They are an extensive encyclopedic approach by which to navigate the various levels and prevailing dynamic of identity, visual and textual stereotypes in cultural media representation. The compile archive is translated into an open system a design method which can be used to initiate a collective critical discourse and foster a diverse multitude of hybrid narratives through counter narratives, photography, text, textile, and address design. Finally, the project can be viewed as a sort of Gesamtkunstwerk uh, since it encompasses a methodology, a dynamic series of archives and collections a book, publication, an exhibition, an interactive installation, and a potential open design workshop program. I'd like to introduce the project with a quote, uh, with a quote by uh, Georges Didi Huberman. Um, deconstructing an image also means to deconstruct our gaze and our certainties. How can we then rethink, deconstruct, decode, reverse, try to unlearn, the associations with cultural identity, visual and textual stereotypes and media representation. Cultural identity can be used to distinguish or divide people, but can also be understood as a constructive instrument that allows us to recognize mutual differences as a common value. New hybrid addresses and narratives can thus be designed by reassociating 
and by reverse looking at images, text, and textile. And secondly, by challenging and rearticulating the forms of visual text or representation or the cultural patterns we are used to. Regarding this, I'd like to paraphrase a reflection by Francesca Mannocchi, a freelance journalist, a documentary filmmaker, and war reporter who covers migration and conflicts uh, and contributes to numerous Italian and international newspapers. She has produced reports in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, Afghanistan, and uh, Libya, among others. She asserts that the only way to understand a phenomenon is by taking time, paying attention, finding and searching for details, zooming in and out to see the larger context. She concludes that if you don't see the details, you can't tell the story. According to Manocchi, uh, being astonished lies at the foundation of real comprehension and restitution of the dynamic and continuous exchange between the representation of reality and reality itself. Astonishment or shock comes therefore from realizing that something is indeed different from how we had imagined it. On a similar note, I include a quote by Italo Calvino, uh, who in his essay um, anthology collection of sand states, seeing means of perceiving differences, and as soon as differences all become uniform in what is predictable and everyday, our gaze simply runs over a smooth surface, devoid of anything to catch hold of. Traveling does serve to reactivate for a second the use of our eyes, the visual reading of the world. Moreover, another quote, uh, George D. D. Uberman has used the concept of the symptom as a, as a metaphor to describe the power of, a, of certain images. D. D. Uberman writes, what is a symptom in, in effect, if not the unexpected, unfamiliar sign often intense and always disruptive, which visually declares something which is not yet visible, something we do not yet know. If the image is a symptom in the critical rather than the clinical sense of the term, if the image is a discontent in representation, it is in that it indicates a future of representation, a future that we know not yet how to read nor even describe. The symbolic dimension of the symptom is indeed not reducible to a simple relation of two elements. It constitutes, as Didi Uberman says, an open, an open set of relations between sets of terms that can themselves be open. He adds, the symptom symbolizes events that have taken place and also events that have not taken place. It symbolizes the thing and also its contrary. This is a quote from uh, his book, uh, uh, Confronting Images, uh, Questioning the Hands of uh, the Ends of a Certain History of Art. Similarly, uh, within the Hybrid Heads project, I'd like to suggest that we could see text, word constraints, as well as images, headdresses, models, and textiles and their dynamic combination as an open Ulipian potential uh, uh, textual framework, a conditional design space to attempt to uncover what narrative and cultural identity could be. In fact, as in press photos, similar stereotypical dynamics could emerge in the text of news narratives. This description, definition, uh, definition, adjectives in relation to gender, social roles, activities, public figures, are often monolithic patterns and generally draw from a stereotypical vocabulary. I'd like to share as an example the systematic use of the anonymous a woman as a catch-all term to describe members of the public in the press in multiple contexts. These are just few articles that were collected on the satirical Wikipedia page dedicated to this particular subject um, and to inform uh, more specifically. How could, uh, um, 
we acknowledge the presence of these vocabulary patterns and embrace them proactively? How could we seek new alternative, maybe anticipatory textual structure and patterns to inform the design research process? We could ask questions like, what would the, uh, the headdress of the first female Mexican president of the United States look like, for example? What would, what would be their visual, textual, and media representation? The Hybrid Ads Research Project started with visual textual research into contemporary headdresses in press photos from around the world. The project arose from an interest to collect, analyze, and compare visual, textual, and textile information regarding contemporary headdresses in order to compile a cross-cultural atlas and to investigate cultural identity and its global representations. A collection of 838 press photos and 838 related news captions has been compiled from the independent Italian weekly magazine Internazionale. Internazionale is the Italian version of the French uh, weekly newspaper Courrier International. Uh, it gathers uh, and, and news from the international press and uh, it translates it into Italian. The criteria for selecting the press, uh, the criteria for selecting the press uh, uh, images for the visual research methodology were as follows. Uh, images had to be related to news of the past five years. Images had to include a visible address. Images were collected on the basis of the country tag system used in uh, Internazionale to gather images worldwide. The maximum number of selected images per country was eight. The research resulted in, uh, in the hybrid ads, visual and textual archive, which were then decoded into 838 source press photos, 838 models, that is uh, a large details photo of the uh, headdresses model, 838 uh, textiles uh, that I co-create, that I design, co-produce, and uh, were made together with the participant of the textile collective of Manoeuvre in Belgium. 838 news caption and 838 indexes. Every element is cross-referenced using codes. Codes connect the information throughout the section and helps browsing the book in the design process. The news captions matching the archive press photos have been decoded and edited into cross-reference alphabetic indexes as well. Every index entry could provide an ever-changing visual overview based on the selected item. Furthermore, thematic categories have been used to inform a dynamic spectrum of design approaches and comparison. Names like Barack Obama, uh, social role, uh, for example, farmers, descriptions like young, uh, resources like cotton, uh, actions uh, as uh, demonstrating, and places, for example, Tokyo. Textual elements of the indexes in the alphabetical, in the alphabetic section can be connected through codes to other visual and textual elements in the book to start creating new narratives. The visual and textual archive has been compiled by country using the lens of addresses, addresses as a browsing tool. The installation created for the exhibition visualizes the found data through a new collection of 169 printed outputs, uh, one per country present in the publication. The five continents are represented by five different book collections. The design of every publication is unique and changes according to the visual and textual data of the represented country. Here we can see uh, one of the continent collection and the, and the unfolded uh, publication. 
the textile research and the first collection of hybrid heads, uh, of hybrid heads are the outcome of my long term art residency at the collective textile studio Manouvre in the Rabot neighborhood of Ghent. The super diversity of the studio provides the ideal context for the preliminary research. It has been relevant to the project team. Uh, teams to contextualize these topics with this intercultural collective before exploring and deepening them on a larger scope. Headdresses in the photos archive displayed a wide range of textile languages, laser cutting, silk screen printing, sewing, embroidery, weaving, crochet and knitting and have been translated into a new archive of 838 handmade, handmade textiles. The press images acted therefore as a way to both explore and experiment with textiles technique and to learn how to work together with the participants in translating them into a new archive of handmade textile samples. In the preliminary research phase, I made short videos where participants of the workshop at Manouf were asked to wear or to introduce the headdresses they know or usually wear and to share their personal connection to them. During the residency, I collaborated with a diverse group of about 50 women and men with different technical textile skills and from different countries, from Turkey to Algeria, from uh, Afghanistan to Cameroon. In, in this project, words, textiles, and images are conceived as a potential data, the active data of a rhizomatic system whose every point can be connected to any other. Therefore, any multiplicity connected to other multiplicities becomes a means to form or to extend a rhizome to continue production of new hybrid heads, a material translation of how a narrative text is itself textus, from the Latin for woman clo woven clothes. The hybrid head design method aims to activate these decoded elements, turning them into symbols. Symbol is used here in its purest sense, a connector of separate things, an image that helps one to move one's mind to another image. Furthermore, the unexpected juxtaposition of two unrelated elements could have the symptomatic potential to provoke new analogies or new path of thought. The design method encourages connections between any pair of decoded elements and triggers alternative narratives linking a model, a textile, with their related indexes. Each combination of model, textile, and words provide an hybrid, a hybrid framework for exploration and design proposal. Entries in the method are multiple, as are the participants' unique perspective and the potential and potential related outcomes. Exploration can move from any visual textual suggestion input or combination of elements, such as images which, uh, images which feature similar, opposite, or complementary gesture, body, body position, actions, topics, context, and uh, rituals, an interest in researching uh, into specific uh, social roles, group or subculture, an interest in specific textile techniques or country, or um, addresses model like protester uh, coverings. The potential of the archive is presented through the first hybrid ads collection of 31 handmade addresses, which I designed and produced in the context of the residency. Every headpiece is a hybrid or a combination of a model, a textile, a textile and the related indexes of the hybrid as archive. The collection and its related storage system to both archive and display the collection are an open design, uh, a modular and universal system that is adaptable to every new headpiece. And here. Yeah. I show you a few of the exhibition. 
the, uh, the project Hybrid Ads was conceived and uh, uh, finally designed as a, as a book that, uh, that was published in April 2019. The book aims to go beyond indexed visual fa fascination or illustration and to offer access to the design method, a tool to actively design new hybrid narratives and dynamic identities. The book draws from both an atlas typology, open design system, textile craft design manual, and design methodology. Furthermore, uh, the interactive installation translates the hybrid ad publication into a special interactive experience through which one discovers and activates the method. Every textual and visual entry of the book is represented by a card. There are about 8,000 cards in total. There are 40 card racks, which literally translate into the space every visual and textual section of the book. Sources, models, textiles, news, uh, indexes. The alphabetical indexes become physical, uh, become physical indexes. Every letter track has, has, has many cards as there are words for that letter in the book. Every card has a RFID uh, tag storing specific data as digital information. At the installation, you are invited to choose any two cards. You can scan the, them to create an A4 print with a visual combination of a model, a textile, and their combi combination of words. The information Daniela. and data on... Yes? <laughs> uh, that's 20 minutes. Uh, you've had your 20 minutes just to let you know to wind up. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And uh, so um, at the installation, uh, you can scan the two cards you select. And uh, this uh, enables you to create an A4 print with the visual combination of a model, a textile, and their combined words. The information and data on the printed document offer then the basis for you to start uh, your with have we have we lost Daniela? Oh, you're there. <laughs> Look, yes, it, it looks like it. Um okay well that's a shame that was an amazing presentation wasn't it so i'll try to oh her. here she is she's back again hi daniela <laughs> yes. hello 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 i'm i'm going to finish <laughs> thanks okay well thank you so much that was that was wonderful fascinating uh, approach um I'm going to share my screen for the last uh, Yes, just uh, the, this is uh, just the final, <laughs> the, can you, can you see me? This is, uh, yes, uh, just to conclude that uh, uh, ultimately with the project, which is still ongoing, um, my aim is to connect with a diverse uh, network of uh, organization, institution and groups, and uh, try to explore these uh, themes further and to reflect with uh, each new iteration on uh, the potential uh, relationship between identity, visual culture, media representation, textile, fashion, and identity today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, <laughs> amazing, very, very detailed work. Um, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to move straight on now to open up questions um, to participants so um, as we did before I believe it's if you want to ask a question can you raise your hands through using the raising hand in the participant um, list uh, and I I will 
direct questions to um, the speakers. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes or to see whether we've got any questions. While we wait, I'll ask a question because <laughs> I wanted to ask Katie, how many prototypes did you make when you were making your masks? How many did you make before you kind of came up with the final one that you were happy with? Or were you happy with it? Would you still? Well, I, um, so I, I did spend a lot of time watching uh, um, lots of YouTube. There were suddenly YouTube videos from all over the world about how to make face masks. So I did, I did have a look at lots of different ways of doing it. And then I found this one from a, yeah, from, like I said, from a dressmaker. Um, and then I think I, I don't, I didn't so much prototype, but I definitely like the first few were all slightly different until I got to the point where I like had a, a sort of a, almost like a kind of batch making system of things and things like like because she suggested putting a third like a third layer and interlining in it so I did do that at first but then I found that they were really thick and it was quite hard, uncomfortable so it's also that it was, a, it was the sort of wearing and using them as well that then um yeah sort of adapted but I think it's yeah definitely it, it definitely sort of came to the point where it's it's sort of slightly different um slightly different from the pattern but yeah thank you but it's, very much. It, yeah it's the it was the sort of it's the sort of weight of responsibility though because i think there's so many you know i'm so i don't think i've ever made anything i don't think i've ever made anything that's like really like gonna like protect you from something that might kill you and that's <laughs> that's yeah. what that's what i think so fascinating about making I mean, there are lots of things that are fascinating about making face masks, but yeah. I can't Thank think you. of it. Yeah. Um, I haven't got any other raised hands, but I've got lots of very appreciative comments in, in, the, in the chat box. Um, Kathy, could I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, of Daniela. Thank you so much for that beautiful <laughs> presentation. Um, felt like I was in an art gallery, which uh, has been a long time since I've been able to do that. So it was absolutely heartwarming and beautiful. I'm really interested in, because I'm an artist bookmaker, um, and I'm really interested in paper as, 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 as a texture of communication. Could you talk us through a little bit your what, why you've chosen paper as your medium of, of sort of visual expression and what's the relationship for you between the textile and the paper? Oh, I can. Yes. Hello. Um, yes. It was, was a, was a long process. Uh, wait, oh, no, okay. Uh, was a long process. And uh, in fact, uh, what is interesting for me is the combination of these uh, paper, um, of the, of the paper in the book. Then uh, there is uh, the possibility, the, the mix of the paper, data, textile, and what you can, uh, what you can uh, do with this, uh, with these different, uh, disciplines and different contexts. So in this case, uh, the paper is to be seen in combination with the data, uh, with the data and the, and the digital uh, possibility, uh, because of course also in the, in the context of the exhibition, there was this uh, interactive installation that uh, through data and through the digital component could uh, enable uh, printing on demand. So, is uh, is interesting for me to see the paper as one of the element of this uh, other with this big in this bigger uh, project and not itself that's uh... thank you so beautiful thank you yeah um i've got a question from allison hi thank you hi. um thank you for that panel it was fantastic um i just have a quick question for katya and kat um i love as you know the politics of pattern patents project 
gift is fantastic. I, I just had a question because I was thinking about risk when you were talking um, and, you know, male risk and working and all of that. Um, and I definitely found that when I was uh, researching mercury poisoning and hatters, for example, that people were patenting masks for them, but that they weren't necessarily worn. So, because, uh, you know, you were male, you took the risk um, of your work often. But I know, and I know you're focusing on the patents and the inventors, but is there any way in which you can also have an idea of how many of these things were actually adopted or worn? Um, so yeah, just question more about that. I'll say something and maybe Katya has more to follow up, but um, yeah, thanks sure. for the question, uh, Alison. Um, it's, it's one of the things that we're really curious about, and that's part of kind of doing this, is that we start with the, um, the archival uh, materials and then we use them as this invitation to go in search of some of those things. So what we're hoping to do is to find out exactly that, is to, is to have, um, is to just start tracing some of these to the inventors and then try and find um, just lots of kind of, you know, um, more evidence for us that enables us to kind of get at um, uh, the experience, um, the, um, the feelings, the, um, uh, just the texture of what this might have been in lived experience and then for us also to make these things if we can't get access to them to actually add that in as kind of another layer of information um, to understand this in different contexts so we right now, but we totally want to be doing that yes thank you I think Katya, did you want to say anything on yeah, that? yeah maybe just to add on that that um, it's also quite interesting because with the the kind of um, quantitative clustering that we've done. We've tried to also look at how risk changes and whether we can also kind of map that against developments of, you know, like new technologies, but also um, health and safety regulations. So that's also where you see a really like big quantitative increase for like just a sheer amount of masks. So these, the masks in the archive and their purpose is obviously speak to to large um social perceptions of what is risk and and at, at a particular point in time and what what does it respond to wonderful thank you and good luck <laughs> thanks um thank you everybody um it is actually time to close this session um so we haven't actually got any more any more hands up so i'm presuming everyone's asked the questions that they need to um there's so much there's so much that's been introduced i think we could probably talk about these presentations all day but um elizabeth i'm going to hand you back to, um back to you as okay, i presume great. yeah yeah there's been some comments um in the 